Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, on my behalf and on behalf of UNDP, I really appreciate the invitation uh, to join your session today and to share some of the findings from our recent uh, research. We have a prevention of violent extremism series. And uh, one of the publications is The Journey to Extremism in Africa. Uh, pathways to, re to recruitment and to disengagement. If I could have the slides, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so to give a little bit of context to start off with, in 2017, UNDP released uh, the first report on the journey to extremism in Africa. And what we really wanted to understand was who are these individuals? What's their profile? And what were their reasons for joining violent extremist groups? We had a primary group uh, of individuals who joined, I mean, of particular focus was voluntary recruits. And then we had a control group. So individuals who were from areas where there was high recruitment, but who did not, uh, who did not join. One of the key elements uh, that we came up with was really looking at the tipping point. And just to note that in 2017, we had 71% of violent extremist voluntary recruits citing heavy-handed security action abuse of human rights as the primary tipping point for the reason that they joined. When we embarked on the study, which was launched in uh, 2023, in uh, February, the first objective was to really understand the changing nature and continental picture of violent extremism in Africa. It's important to note, and when we look at uh, the Global Terrorism Index for 2022 and then into 2023, there has been uh, more violent extremist activity in the African continent. In 2023, we have five out of the 10 most affected countries in Africa. These are Burkina Faso, Somalia, Mali, Nigeria, and Niger. We have also noticed a spread of violent extremist activity in the Gulf of Guinea, in uh, Mozambique, and affecting Southern Africa, and also in the Great Lakes region, most specifically in DRC. So certainly a spread of risk, and also a spread in terms of uh, the attacks. So looking at the context and also noting that there have been increased efforts to counter and prevent violent extremism, we also wanted to see how effective these efforts are. The second objective was again to see uh, the drivers, tipping points and accelerators. And so really looking at have there been variations between 2017 and 2023. The third was to explore pathways from extremism, also noting that there has been a lot more in terms of disengagement and mass ed exits. And if there has been, you know, what we call a turning point for individuals leaving the group. And uh, the fourth objective was to really have a much stronger gendered lens, so a dimension which has certainly not been explored enough, uh, both from the policy and uh, programmatic levels. Regarding the approach, uh, it was similar to the 2017 approach, looking at political socialization theory. So looking at pathways to and from violent extremism in relation to the world around individuals. So exposure to other ideas, values, and belief systems. And this allows us to un uncover what we call a journey map of critical enabling factors, drivers, and triggers in the recruitment and disengagement process. In terms of the respondents, we had almost 2,200 uh, respondents across eight countries. So increasing the data set from 2017 and this cut across eight countries. You will notice that it's an overlap of uh, Lake Chad Basin and Liptakogorma area, and then Somalia and Sudan. So similar to the first study, we have a primary group of individuals who were part of violent extremist groups. This was about a thousand individuals, some of whom were still part of the groups at the time of the interviews. And then also having a control group, and we delve much deeper this time around also into resilience factors or protective factors of why individuals did not join. 
As mentioned, we also looked at the pathways and drivers to disengagement uh, with a particular focus on voluntary disengagement, and as mentioned, a greater focus on the gendered approach. Just wanted to give you a bit of a snapshot in terms of the demographic sample across countries. Also, in terms of uh, age and sex, one that was quite interesting in terms of findings was also noting in terms of the ages, recruitment is quite young, um, although I hesitate to call it recruitment, but we see an increase in children being part of these violent extremist groups starting as young as 10, and you see the sharp curve of voluntary recruits uh, from 10 to 17 years old. As mentioned, we also try to have a little bit more of um, female respondents and also just to unpack gendered pathways, both of men and women. So we had about 25% uh, women respondents and 75% male. In terms of the uh, data collection, uh, this gives you an indication of where these individuals were, what was their status. So be it awaiting formal process, um, those without a formal status, formal process or um, under under formal process. So you can see the breakdown in terms of rehabilitation, uh, surrender, amnesty, arrested, uh, which is there, and also the breakdown in terms of membership of the group and differentiated by sex as well. In terms of uh, you know some of the main findings, First, in terms of, um, you know, patterns in terms of response. I mean, we looked at uh, the UN counterterrorism strategy and what we found for the last two years in terms of commitments uh, against the four pillars of the strategy, there was more commitment, 73%, to counterterrorism measures and only 24% committed to addressing conditions conducive to violent extremism, and only 3% measures to ensure respect for human rights for all and rule of law. We also looked at investments in peace building, prevention of violent extremism in the eight countries under study. And what we found was that out of the overseas development assistance going to these countries, there was only 2% uh, out of the total that was committed to peace building and preventative measures. So quite a disparity in terms of you know, commitments. And this is one of the key uh, calls of the UN Secretary General in terms of having more of a balanced holistic approach Indeed, noting that security measures are important, but also that they need to be complemented by stronger focus on preventative efforts, as well as response with a development lens to look at more sustainable interventions. In terms of the pathways to recruitment, the most cited reason by the voluntary recruits at 25% was for employment. However, what was particularly interesting was that out of this group, over 60% were already employed. So there was no correlation with unemployment uh, and uh, in terms of joining. And what this might speak to is also looking for better opportunities and also noting that uh, the majority of these were young men who were married. So again, could speak to societal expectations um, in terms of provision for the family. In terms of uh, the statistical relationship between levels of trust and joining, in the 2017 study, there was a significant difference between the primary group and the control group in terms of levels of trust. And at the time, the primary group, 73%, had very little trust in national governments and security. However, what we found is that in 2023 study, there was very small difference. So 58% of voluntary recruits exhibited little to no trust in national government, but for the control group, this was at 50%. So this uh, you know, really exhibits more of a fraying of the social contract uh, among populations. And just to note that a lot of the, um, a lot of the interviews took place in borderland and peripheral areas, which is where we've seen a lot more recruitment uh, taking place. 
also just to speak, you know, in terms of um, ideological issues, and this was also quite a significant difference, is that uh, in the first study, we had about 40% citing religious or ideological reasons for joining. And uh, this time round, this was only 17%. However, very well worth noting that in both studies, what we found of those who do cite um, religious or ideological reasons have uh, little to no understanding of religious texts and noted that they needed these texts to be interpreted for them. However, we do note that religious ideology is often used as a vector in terms of recruitment and those who perceived their religions to be a threat. This was one of the elements of uh, vulnerability to joining. We further explored the element of a tipping point, uh, which had come out quite strongly in the 2017 report. And what we found from those who cited that they had a tipping point, uh, which was 48%, 71% experienced short, punctuated and sharp escalations of human rights abuses, such as government action, killing of a friend or a family member or arrest of one. So quite similar on that end. A finding that was quite interesting was uh, in terms of access to information and communication and low levels of access actually increased vulnerability. What we found overall was that of the voluntary recruits, these tended to be people who were more isolated than the control group. So in terms of also engagement with people from other ethnic groups, uh, other religions, and they also had a lack of access to internet at the time of joining or very low access, and they tended to join more quickly. So this uh, was particularly interesting, noting that there has been a lot of focus and discussion in terms of the role of the internet uh, in terms of recruitment strategies. But what we found in the Africa region, uh, in the countries under study, that there's a lot more focus on the peer-to-peer and the personal relationship, so be it family, friends, a trusted member within the community. And this is reflected in the last point, um, which I wanted to highlight, which is that uh, men tended to join with friends and 50% of female recruits joined with family members and in particular their husbands. So this is just a bit of a snapshot, um, you know, just giving a bit of the differences in terms of the gender drivers uh, to recruitment. Uh, looking at economic factors, these were less salient for women. Indeed, in terms of religious ideology, for women particularly low at 5%, uh, but again, noting that the majority, uh, significant number rather of women tended to join with family members, the peer influence being quite strong. And in terms of a sense of uh, belonging, I mean, it is a slight difference, but, but there is a difference for men, it was about 12% and for women, 8%. To go into the pathways to disengagement, and uh, what was quite interesting, you know, we note is that, you know, in terms of looking for better opportunities, uh, the um, these not being met uh, is really the primary reason for people leaving and 77% of those who chose to leave voluntarily through surrender or amnesty said that their expectations were not met. There was particular disappointment in terms of the monetary rewards and this was particularly for those who joined more quickly at 42%. The element of disillusionment with the group's ideology and or actions were key in terms of triggering what we frame as a turning point away from these uh, groups. And we found that 68% stated they no longer agree with the group's actions as the most influential primary reason. And uh, also no longer believing in the group's ideology, and this was particularly significant among females at 85%. In terms of the peer influence of uh, family and friends, we see this reflected not only in terms of recruitment, uh, but also in terms of disengagement patterns. And what we do see is cascading effects uh, whereby people tended to leave more with others than on their own.
and 40% of those who disengage stated that government incentives and amnesty programs influenced their decision to leave. Again, just to give a bit of a snapshot, um, you know, of the reasons for leaving violent extremist groups, there were various questions. So first looking at, uh, you know, what were the initial answers and then looking at the most salient factors that led individuals to leave. And as mentioned in terms of, um, you know, leaving on one's own or with family members, friends, husband or wife, this gives you a bit of a a picture also in terms of the difference between male and female respondents and seeing the significant difference those who left alone we see eight percent of men four percent of women compared to those who left uh, with others in terms of the implications i mean what we do often see is that the PVE field is often uh, quite gender blind and it really is important to have a gendered lens to uncover these violent extremist dynamics. As you will note also in terms of uh, the membership of groups, the reasons you know, for joining, uh, they do differ across gender. So they do you know, highlight, um, you know, and it's important to have this understanding of the trajectory and pathways into and out of violent extremist groups. And this will also help in terms of more targeted uh, programming and policy efforts. So while we did make an effort, I mean, we also note that there is a lot more that could be unpacked. And one of the recommendations from the report is really to delve deeper into some of, uh, some of these gendered findings. The second point was really looking at masculinities and violent extremism. And what we note is that these violent extremist groups also tend to thrive within what we would call conflict ecosystems and mobilize existing grievances. So while they might be inspired by more global ideas or ideologies, the violent extremist groups really leverage on these local level grievances. And we can see this also in terms of elements of trust, for example, in, um, in government. And we did do trust measurements and also, you know, looking at elements of satisfaction, for example, you know, with the judicial systems. And we found in one case whereby 83% of respondents from one country said that they had more trust in the justice system of the violent extremist groups. So quite significant there. When we look at ideas of manhood, power, and masculinity, uh, we can see, you know, when we look at sort of the primary reason, you know, for joining being for, you know, employment uh, opportunities. I mean, this can also speak to issues around upwards mobility, um, being a factor, looking at elements of status quo, and also social, you know, responsibility. So this is another key element and um, that needs to be taken into account in terms of the approaches and gender mainstreaming. And also more of an, um, you know, needs to be more of an element of including, um, you know, more of this lens within the women, peace and security agenda as well. We had a set of questions, which I didn't go into, but which also asked uh, the respondents questions around uh, prevention of violent extremism activities, whether they were aware of them. Uh, we found that there were a higher number of men who were aware of uh, prevention of violent extremism activities taking place rather than women. Um, however, in cases where women were aware of PVE efforts, they tended to be a lot more engaged in these efforts. Um, one element that also is quite striking, I'd say, is the difference, you know, in terms of the uh, religious ideological factors being a motivator and uh, the role that women could potentially play uh, in terms of being a bulwark or, you know, addressing some of these uh, narratives which are used as a grievance uh, to mobilize voluntary recruits. So I will conclude uh, with highlighting some of the policy implications drawn from the findings. The first is really a need to have more effective oversight on human rights compliance, rule of law and accountability. As mentioned, you know, having security responses is extremely important, but also the need, you know, for there to be stronger compliance, noting that this is such a critical factor 
in terms of uh, voluntary recruitment into violent extremist groups. So some of these efforts end up being counter uh, counterproductive. The social contract is very key, um, noting that these uh, primary respondents come from very peripheral areas in terms of also um, state citizen relationships, as we saw, you know, very low trust across. Um, but as mentioned, we looked at trust measurements across different categories, and there was a lot more trust in local government, local community leaders, religious leaders than there was at the national level. So really the need to be more of an effort in terms of social contract. Um, the next also speaks to a related issue because a lot of these areas have governance or development deficits, you know, mentioned about justice um, sector, but also when we look at the issue of employment, we have 73% of uh, the voluntary recruits being dissatisfied with employment opportunities that were provided uh, or were available in their localities. So really looking at strengthening state legitimacy through improved service delivery, quality and accountability of state service provision. And also noting that in some of these epicenter countries where there is violent extremist activity, there has been a bit of, um, you know, more of this framing of proto-state competitors and these violent extremist and terrorist groups uh, really taking on functions of the state and being these, uh, these competitors. Embedding a conflict sensitive approach in efforts to address violent extremism is also key. I mean, also noting the fact that issues around marginalization or feeling targeted is an element uh, that increases vulnerability you know, to those joining. And so not um, targeting certain populations, really having more of an informed approach. Upscaling localized community-based approaches to preventing violent extremism. And um, also really reinvigorating prevention efforts within peace building and sustainable development policy frameworks. And on that note, I just wanted to share, you know, a few examples, because what we have also seen in the past seven years, as I started off, you know, by mentioning, there are a lot more efforts to prevent and counter, but also to address uh, conditions for those exiting the groups. And uh, when we look at the exiting, this is really important, so as to ensure that they don't return to the same conditions, you know, which they left. Uh, but also having efforts that are conflict sensitive. And so not just focusing on the returnees, but also the communities uh, whom they are returning to and really strengthening resilience uh, factors within these communities. So um, just to give a couple of examples uh, in uh, Borno state in uh, Northern Nigeria, there has been the reconstruction of over 500 homes in, uh, in Garanam village. And it's also efforts to provide economic empowerment to those within um, the village. So having incentives to really shift the development narrative and ownership, so also restoration of markets and providing these opportunities that not only create stronger resilience you know, economically, but also in terms of the elements of social contract in terms of provision of these services and also the primary role really of um, of the uh, federal government, uh, you know, in this case and Borno state as well. So also strengthening the social contract there. We've seen also the localization of uh, PCVE action plans. Kenya is a good example. We have Mombasa County that uh, had the first subnational county action plan, and it really mirrors this whole of society approach in terms of addressing violent extremism and so more of this concerted effort and um, what we have seen you know in terms of also uh, trends in funding there has been a decrease in terms of the military or security expenditure in northern cameroon there was a human rights uh, observatory that was established uh, during the pilot phase there were about 170 human rights violations that were identified and there was a platform um, in terms of referral response and accountability, also dialogue platforms set up between military and civilians. 
And this helped in terms of improving the trust relationship, early warning as well. There were increased reports on possible attacks. There was also increased awareness. Um, and what was noted in this area, I mean, this is among other efforts as well, um, among other actors to note, that there was a reduction in voluntary recruitment recorded in 2021. So really seeing how there are these effective approaches, but they tend to be these small scale promising practices and seeing how can these be better upscaled. And finally, really looking at investing in cost effective prevention and long term development. I mean, we have seen the spread of violent extremism uh, within the continent. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on security and really the main message that we see coming out from this type of report is when we look at the drivers into um, it really is focused very heavily on these governance aspects on development. And so really needing more of an effort in terms of the prevention of addressing these issues. So having a stronger development lens and also noting that we don't want individuals returning to the same conditions. So how do we better mainstream prevention within long term development? So just to conclude with a quote um, from one of the respondents, and uh, this was one thing which we also tried to do throughout the report is going beyond the data and really trying to hear the stories of the individuals um, who join these violent extremist groups to really understand their motivations, their fears, their needs. And so this is reflective and um, in the report. And we've also you know, done a highlight, as I mentioned, you know, some of these promising practice to better inform the policy and uh, programmatic implications and recommendations emerging from this study. Thank you very much.